That won't factor. So do you have any ideas of how you could solve it? Any? Um, it would be a quadratic equation. How, how, what do you mean? What could we try? Yeah, it's a quadratic equation because of the square. And so our methods of solving quadratic equations are, um, factoring the square root method and quadratic formula. Square root method will work fine on that. You can either subtract 3 and then divide by negative 1, or you can just add tangent square to both sides. It doesn't matter which one of those you do. Um, if you just add tangent square to both sides, you have 3 equals tangent squared beta. And then what? Take the square root of both sides, and as soon as you said take the square root, bells and whistles went off to remind me what? Don't forget the plus or minus. Tangent beta would be plus or minus square root of 3. Now, I know that it's at the multiples of pi over 6 that I get a square root of 3 in um, either my x coordinate or the y coordinate. But again, I probably, you may be better at this than I am, but I have to look at um, the coordinates of the point on the unit circle at pi over 6 and pi over 3 to see which one, if I divided the y by the x, would give me square root of 3. I, I almost can't do that without looking at the ordered pair. So which one would the y divided by the x give me square root of 3? <laughs> Pi over 3, because the y divided by the x would be square root of 3 over 2 times the reciprocal of 1 half, which is 2. The 2s would cancel, leave me square root of 3. So I want pi over 3 in the first quadrant. Um, but how many times in the unit circle is um, tangent going to be square root of 3? either positive or negative. That's going to happen once in every quarter. In the first and the third quarter, you're going to uh, quadrant, you're going to get a positive square root of 3. In the second and fourth quadrants, you're going to get a negative square root of 3, but it's going to happen four times. Now, I want to write my answer as simply as possible, but I want to make sure that I'm hitting all the right angles. Um, is there... Something I could just add multiples of that would give me not only that first quadrant angle, but the second quadrant angle, the third quadrant angle. Let's see. Pi over 3 plus pi over 4. Pi over 4 is, um, yeah, that wouldn't, that wouldn't be 90 degrees from there. It's not the same distance from here to here as it is from here to here. So I don't think I'm going to be able to just add multiples, uh, right one angle and all the multiples of something. Um, I think I'm going to have to write two solutions. If I write that solution, then I can get this third quadrant solution by just adding multiples of what? pi, and then if I give this second quadrant solution, I can get all the fourth quadrant solutions by just adding multiples of pi. But I think I'm going to have to write at least two answers separately to get all the, the angles in all four quadrants. So I feel like I had left myself enough room there to write something else. Pi over 3 is the first quadrant 
angle whose tangent is square root of 3, and then you said add multiples of 180 degrees or pi n radians. That will give me all the quadrant 1 and quadrant 3 angles. And then what's the second quadrant angle we're looking for? You could use that. I would be surprised if that's how it's written in the back of the book. Instead of using negative pi over 3, I bet it will use 16263646 or 2 thirds pi and add multiples of pi over n to that. But you would be right. You could use negative pi over 3 plus all the multiples of pi after that. I just don't think that's how it will be written in the back of the book. That's the second and fourth quadrant angles. So the square root method works with trig functions just like it does um, algebraic functions. Don't forget when you take the square root of both sides, you're going to get the plus or minus. Um, number 30 is pretty much like that. Number 31 and 32 are like 24 were in that they're already factored. So I'm not going to do one of those, but look at 34. There is something harder about number 34. What do you think makes it a little bit harder? It's quadratic, and it's not difficult to get in standard form. Just subtract one from both sides, and I'd have it in standard form. But there would still be something difficult or some obstacle to overcome. What is it? Yeah, but I don't think I can factor it. If it would factor, that would be absolutely fine. But once I get it in standard form, that's not going to factor. Why is it not going to factor? It has two different trig functions in it, all right? There are no factors of cosine that when you fold that back together and combine like terms, it's going to give you sine in the middle. So that's the problem. Does anybody have an idea about how to solve the problem? Mm, that would be legal. I'm not sure what it is that you're you're saying divide both sides of the equation by well it would change that to 2 cosine x plus this would actually become tangent x minus 1 over cosine then you'd have um You'd still have two trig functions. You've just changed cosine and sine to cosine and tangent, but you still have two trig functions. Mm hmm Which one? You need to either write the cosine in terms of the sine or the sine in terms of the cosine. Um, I would substitute. 1 minus sine square in place of cosine square, because if I took the Pythagorean identity and solved it for just sine, I'd end up with square roots, and I don't want to end up with square roots. So just put 1 minus sine square 
in place of cosine squared. And then you have some cleaning up to do, and you still are just keeping your fingers crossed that it'll factor. That's my equation in standard form. Um, I don't like to try to factor something with a leading coefficient negative. So I would factor out a negative one and then divide both sides by negative one just to avoid um, factoring with that negative leading coefficient. You go ahead and factor that for me. Actually, factor it, set each factor equal to zero, and see what you get for solutions. Everybody have it factored correctly? When you set each factor equal to zero, you see that you're looking for solutions to sine x is negative one half or sine x equals one. How many times on the unit circle does sine x equal positive one? Only one square at pi over two or half pi. So x equals pi over two is the only solution to that second equation in one revolution of the unit circle, but we're supposed to be writing the solutions in infinitely many of the um, revolutions of the unit circle. So we need to add all the coterminal angles as part of that solution. Now, Luke, um, since you missed that yesterday, the directions on 1 through 42 said find all solutions, and then 43 to 63 say find the solutions in one revolution of the unit circle. So at least for these first 40, 41 problems, when we find one solution, we need to write all of its coterminal angles to get infinitely many revolutions of the unit circle. If you let n be zero, n just stands for any integer. 
not, not integer, I keep saying that, um, but I mean any whole number, starting with zero. If you let n be zero, then the first solution is just pi over two. If you let n be one, the second solution is pi over two plus two pi, or five halves pi. So just let n be two, three, four, five onto infinity, and you have all the angles whose sign is one. And then here, um, I'm looking for solutions to sine x is negative one half. How many times in one revolution of the unit circle is sine going to be negative anything? Two. And um, that would be in the third and fourth quadrants where your y is negative. And specifically, you're looking for y being negative one half. Is that close to the x-axis or close to the y-axis where the y is negative one half? Here, you're close to the y being negative one. Here, your y is closer to a half. So you're looking for these two angles. Can you just write one of them and then all the multiples of 90 degrees or pi over 4 radians after that? Let's see, that's 7, 6 pi. Could you just say 7, 6 pi plus uh, pi over 4 n? Well, if you added one pi over four, then you'd get this angle that you wanted. But the next time you added pi over four, you'd get a fourth quadrant, a first quadrant angle where sine is no longer negative. So you're going to have to write these separately. This third quadrant angle and all of its coterminal angles, this fourth quadrant angle and all of its coterminal angles. So x would be seven six pi. And all of its coterminal angles for 11 sixth pi and all of its coterminal angles. That original equation has three different solutions in one revolution of the unit circle, and then all the angles that are coterminal with those three. All right, um, 30, thirty-six cosine two x times secant two x plus two equals zero. In 34, it was definitely a problem that we had two different trig identities. I had to write one in terms of the other in order to just get one trig identity that I could factor. I have the same problem in 36. I have two trig functions, but do I need to fix that problem in 36? Why not? Why did it have to be fixed in 34 and doesn't have to be fixed in 36? Because it's already factored for you. And the only reason I had to write cosine in terms of sine in 34 was so that I could factor, but this is already factored. So cosine 2x equals 0 or secant 2x plus 2 equals 0. Where does cosine equal 0? At all the half pi's, and that's not what x is, that's what 2x is. You're solving for the argument there, 2x is pi over 2, um, is there something that I could add to get all of the angles whose cosine would be zero? Yeah, pi, pi over two, and then 
here, cosine zero, and then here and here and on and on. X would be, um, no, I'm sorry, I didn't start that sentence right. All you would have to do to get all the angles whose cosine is zero is start at pi over two and add multiples of 180 degrees or pi n radians. But again, that's not what x is, that's what 2x is. So x would have to be pi over 4 plus pi over 2 radians, or pi over 2n. Um, if you just graphed y equals cosine 2x, what would its period be? If you just graphed y equals cosine 2x, its period is pi. Um, that's why I had pi in. Wait, something's bugging me. That's right, so what's bugging me? Hmm. Yeah, that's that's not bugging me, but I'm gonna I'm gonna let go of what's bugging me for just a minute. Sometimes when I let the back of my brain stew on it in a minute, it'll figure it out. But I don't see anything we've done wrong there. You're right, we're not finished. We still have to solve this equation. Um, what would we have to do first? Yeah, this, this two that's added is not part of the argument. So we have to get the trig expression by itself by subtracting two from both sides and I don't think in terms of secant very well. If you give me secant, I'm going to rewrite it as what? 1 over cosine. If secant 2x equals negative 2, then um, 1 over cosine 2x is negative 2. Or it would have been even easier to say if secant is negative 2, then what is cosine? Yeah, negative 1 half. That's the same thing we would get if we solve this equation by multiplying both sides by cosine and then dividing by negative 2. I just didn't have to write it. It seems like that made it a little bit worse before I made it better. If secant is negative 2, cosine is negative 1 half. And where on the unit circle is cosine negative? Which quadrants? Cosine, which is your x-coordinate. Your x-coordinate is negative in the second and third quadrants. So think of where in the second quadrant cosine is negative one half. Well, I know right here it's almost negative one. So right here is where cosine would be negative one half. And then that angle in the third quadrant. So one six two six three six four six. That's two thirds pi. And again, that's not what x is. That's what two x is. Two x equals two thirds pi. Can I just add multiples of ninety degrees to get this other um, third quadrant angle? With this, I could. But the next multiple of a quarter pi would get me the fourth quadrant angle, and the next one would get me the first quadrant angle. So I'm going to have to write these um, 
two angles separately to not pick up the first and fourth quadrant angles that I don't want. Two third, two X equals two thirds pi plus all of its coterminal angles or two X equals that's six, six, seven, six, eight, six or four thirds pi and all of its coterminal angles. And then just divide both sides of both equations by two. All right, so we have three angles, three solutions, and one revolution of the unit circle, and then all their coterminal angles. Um, tell me, I'm not going to write down number 38, but tell me the only thing you'd have to recognize to know how to begin that problem. Yeah, there's a GCF, factor out a tangent and go from there. What about, holy cow, just when you thought it couldn't get any worse, you have sine of log or natural log of sine. Let's look at those two. The most wrong thing you could possibly do is probably the first thing that jumps out at you. You could divide both sides by sine, but sine without an argument doesn't make any sense. If you have sine x equals um, whatever, you can't just divide both sides by sine to get the x by itself because sine x doesn't mean sine times x. And so we can't do that here either. Hmm. Any ideas? Here's what's scaring me about the problem. What if, just to take the fear out of it, I called it U for ugly. What if I was just solving sine ugly equals zero? That doesn't look so scary anymore. Where is Where on the unit circle is sine zero? At all the whole pies, and so that's what ugly has to equal. Ugly would be, you could just call it pi n. If n is 0, then ugly is 0. If n is 1, then ugly is pi. That would get you all your whole pies. But that's not what x is. That's what ugly is. You have to put log of x back in place of the ugly, and then it's still ugly. How do you solve that for x?
Yeah. Um, one of the biggest tools for solving logarithmic equations is change them to exponential form. What's the base of that logarithm? Yeah, since it's not written, it's understood to be 10. So when you write that in um, exponential form, what would it be? Mm -hmm. 10 is the base, pi n is the exponent, and 10 to the pi n gives you x. You could also let n be a few whole numbers and just check your answer if you're not sure. If n is 0, then this is just 10 to the 0. What's 10 to the 0? 1. And so to check that, if you let x be 1, what is log of 1? Log base 10 of 1. Or log base anything of 1. It means the exponent of 10, which gives you 1. What exponent of 10 would give you 1? 0. So if x is 1, then log of x is 0. And sure enough, sine of 0 is 0. When you let n be 1, you just have x equals 10 to the pi, log base 10 of 10 to the pi. The log base 10 of 10 undo each other, and this is just sine of pi. Sine of pi equals 0 as well. All right, what about the other one that has natural log in it? Natural log of sine x equals 0. The most illegal thing you could possibly do is divide both sides by ln. But this is not multiplication. Hey, I meant to say one other thing about number 40. You don't have to write down this substitution. Um, if it helps you, you can. But this is just what's in my head. When I see sign of something that scares me, I'm going to call it sign of ugly. Solve for ugly and then just put log back in place of the ugly. All right, what do you think we can do on 42? The words you need are still on the screen. Yeah, that's one of the biggest tools for solving logarithmic equations. Change that to exponential form. Natural log means log base, what, e. So what would this be in exponential form? Yep, the base is e. The exponent is 0. Did you say x or sine x? Yeah, e to the 0 equals sine x. That hardly looks any better. What else do I need to recognize? Yeah, e to the 0 is 1. So now I'm just solving sine x is 1. Where on the unit circle is sine x 1? Um, at pi over 2. And that's the only place in one revolution of the unit circle. So x is pi over 2 and all of its coterminal angles. All right, here's where the directions change. Um, we're through with the 
and all of its coterminal angles because 43 through 63 just say find all solutions that are in the interval from 0 to 2 pi. And notice that 0 has a bracket on it. 0 is included and 2 pi is not. Um, so that there's no overlap in one revolution of the unit circle. If you mean the positive x-axis, then write it as 0 instead of at 2 pi. All of your solutions need to be between 0 and 2 pi, including 0, but not the 2 pi. All right. Um, what about, wow, this is one they've just added. I, I don't want to do it. We could, but 46, what do you think is the key to, Solving number 46. It's the sum of two cubes. I don't think you have one of those in your homework, but number 46, you'd have to solve the sum of two cubes or factor the sum of two cubes. Um, what about, um, let's do 50. What do you think is the first thing we have to do? Tori, I just didn't hear you. Ooh, something before that. We have to get it set equal to zero before we factor, just like any quadratic equation. So add one to both sides. And then factor. You go ahead and factor that. Are the two um, equations you're solving cosine equals negative one half or cosine equals negative one? Now we only have to find the solutions in one revolution of the unit circle. So in what quadrants is cosine negative? That's your x coordinate, and x is negative in the second and third quadrant. So we're looking for the second and third quadrant where x is negative a half. Is that going to be closer to the x-axis or the y-axis in those two quadrants? Yeah, x is going to be a half here and here, which is 2 thirds pi. And that's four six five six 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 seven six eight six or four thirds pi.
And then where is cosine negative 1? Yep, the negative x-axis or pi radians. Um, number 52. What do you think? is the first thing we need to do here. That's that's what my gut says. Now, it also says if I need to, I can rewrite that secant square as 1 over cosine square, but it's possible I won't have to, so I'm not going to do that yet. Let me show you um, why you don't need to do that. If you have, for example, x squared equals x, if you're solving this equation, um, and you divide both sides by x, you just get x equals 1. But that's not the only solution. What's the other solution? No. Are you saying it, Raven? What would make this equation true other than 1? 0 would. That zero got lost when you divided both sides by a variable and you didn't know what that variable stood for. So instead of dividing by a variable, you need to factor and that will give you both solutions. That keeps you from losing a solution. And so we need to do the same thing here. Instead of dividing by cosine, we need to subtract cosine. so that we're not dividing by some variable expression that we don't know the value of. And then factor out a co I don't know why I still have one. I don't know why I have one there. It's supposed to be zero. Um, then you can factor out cosine. And you're not going to have to rewrite that secant in terms of cosine because they're part of two different factors. Just solve cosine x equals 0 or secant square x equals 1. Tangents. Um, it didn't occur to me, but that would be absolutely fine. It's absolutely legal. It's probably six one way, half dozen the other as far as what's easiest. Didn't occur to me, but that, that certainly could be done. Um, I don't think it'll be hard to find where secant squared equals one. That's where secant is what? Don't forget the plus or minus. When you take the square root of both sides, you get secant as plus or minus 1. So cosine is 0 two times in one revolution of the unit circle. Cosine is 0 at pi over 2 and 3 halves pi. And then where is secant? either positive or negative 1. Secant is, secant is 1 wherever cosine is 1, because secant's the reciprocal of cosine. And cosine is 1 at the, did you say half pies or whole pies? Whole pies. The whole pies are where x is either positive 1 or negative 1. So 0 and pi. Um, let me think, though. So. Something. 
how can I caution you about this? <clears throat> I'm trying to make up some algebraic equivalent. We have a problem here, and I'm trying to think how to be on the alert for this potential problem. Um, Secant is a rational expression. The definition of secant is 1 over cosine. Anytime you um, solve a rational expression and you don't do anything illegal and you get some possible answers, what do you have to watch out for with a rational expression? Extraneous solutions, which would occur when what happens? No, whenever you get zero in the denominator. So I cannot use in my solution anything that would make secant um, undefined, which would be wherever cosine is zero. Secant's undefined wherever cosine is zero. So if I had thought about that before, I could have just not solved that equation. I can't use pi over 2 and 3 halves pi because secant is undefined there. So there are only two solutions, 0 and pi. And all I can think to compare it to algebraically is just any time we've ever solved an equation that had a fraction in it, we had to eliminate from the answers anything that made the denominator zero or anything that made the rational expression undefined. All right, we have time for one or two more. Um, what? 56 We can do this one very quickly, but it's a squint and figure it out problem. I don't want to write sine in terms of cosine or cosine in terms of sine. I'd really like to not involve square roots unless I absolutely have to. What has to be true about two numbers that you subtract and get zero? They have to be the same number. Or in other words, we could just add cosine x to both sides, and we're looking for wherever sine x and cosine x have the same value. Where on the unit circle do sine and cosine have the same value, or do the x-coordinate and the y-coordinate have the same value? At quarter pies, would it be all the quarter pies? Quarter pies in the first and third quadrant. In the second and the fourth quadrant, they're opposites of each other. But the quarter pies in the first and the third quadrant, sine and cosine are the same thing. Quarter pi, sine and cosine are both positive square root of 2 over 2. And then 5 fourths pi, sine and cosine are both negative square root of 2 over 2. 